All right. So here we are. This is the Tech Humanist Show. Um, but we're behind the scenes, sort of. We're having a conversation with you, Giselle, and I'll I'll take care of your intro and everything later. We'll we'll get into that in the show. Sure. Um, what I'd love to do is just jump right in and start talking about you know the future of work and and the future of jobs and the future of the workplace in specific, uh, yeah. and and how that's going to play out uh, when we think about the Great Resignation and the move to hybrid and remote and uh, distributed work forces, work teams, and the metaverse and all that stuff. So um, just real quick, I, would you mind giving us kind of the, the broad strokes on uh, where you're coming from within your role about the future of work and, and how you approach that subject? Absolutely. So I am basically like a futurist uh, in all things, especially when it comes to the future of work. I, I'm a thought leader and I talk a lot about kind of how do we approach the future of work from an inclusive uh, aspect. So I'm always thinking about what's next, but I'm also thinking about taking people along with us uh, along the way, making sure everybody has a, a positive experience. So that's that's what I'm about. Um, but I do a lot of speaking. I do consulting, uh, both internally in the organization that I'm in to help the direction of our innovation and then externally uh, to help lead other people with their digital transformation. I love it. That's the keeping people, making sure people are coming along part really resonates with me. And I want to make sure we get into that in, the, in terms of the diversity and inclusion and equity piece. Okay. Um, but I wanted to get right into thinking about, you know, the 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 future of the workplace. Uh, when we think about, you know, what the role of the workplace has been historically and how it, it has served as this kind of, you know, social gathering place and a, a sort of project nexus. Um, and, and in terms of now this move to, you know, a lot more remote and distributed teams, you know, largely driven by the pandemic, but also uh, I think being, being sort of facilitated by just the, the the potential of doing this work uh, and everybody being able to do it. What do you think is really the the importance of of place in the workplace, and and how do you think that we will revisit that as we go? Forward? Yeah, that's a good question. I think that place it has more to do with where people feel comfortable working and contributing their best and being able to, it's not about just the physical space or even if it's a virtual space, it's more about where can people feel like they can contribute the best and socialize and interact and bring forth their creativity the best way. So whether that's, hey, I need to be in an office and I need to connect with somebody physically so that I can see them and have that tactile experience, that's great. But maybe it's also I need to be home for whatever the reason is. I work better there. I, I like the uh, flexibility from working from anywhere and everywhere. Or maybe it's a combination of both with that hybrid approach. So I think it's less about the physicality of where the work is getting done and more are we creating the space for people to be able to uh, meet the values of bringing their contribution and their best selves and that social interaction that may be needed at work. And it feels like we, we learned a lot during the active stage. I, I, I don't want to say like uh, post pandemic or during the pandemic, since we are still actively in a pandemic, but during yeah. the acute phase uh, for many of us in, of the pandemic, it seems like we learned an awful lot about, you know, sort of work-life integration and what it means for many of us to, to have these distinct roles uh, as in our jobs, but at, at our homes and in our families as caretakers or whatever our, our functions are. Um, it it also feels like we we've learned a lot about that. What what do you think that that is going to um, imply for us going forward? How is that going to shape the way that we we approach work, jobs, and the workplace kind of overall? Yeah, I think I think it's more about us realizing that work is not all that we are, and I think that there's been this great and general global awakening of, wait a minute, what matters? What's, what are my priorities in life? So some people have left their very high paying roles, um, but because they had stress attached to it or because they needed to be at home caregiving, or now they have uh, different issues with their own health care or mental health that came up and they're prioritizing self over this idea of I live to work, I live to work, I live to work, right? And so I think everything what we've been seeing as far as this uh, ability to work from different places, the ability to think about choosing when you're going to work, uh, how long is my work week? Um, can I come in and out of my shifts throughout the day? Can I work on projects? Can I de de 
uh, structure and break down what work is and work at it my way? Can I uh, add it, become a part of the gig economy, right? So there's like, I think the value system of, of humanity globally has shifted a lot and people have been reassessing how do I want to spend my time? How do I want to live my life? Uh, how do I want to spend time with those who matter to me the most? And in work should not be something that is driving all of that. Our lives should be driving that uh, work experience. I think that's what's been what we've been seeing. Yeah, our lives should be driving the work experience this is a pretty good takeaway. I wonder too about how you think about um, the, the role technology has in facilitating these more um, versatile workplaces. Yeah. And, I mean, I, I guess specifically the metaverse is the the first, you know, sort of concept that I think many people would, would jump to. But it, even just uh, remote and collaborative tools, I wonder, you know, are you thinking about how those are changing the nature and shape of, you know, teamwork and, and culture within workplaces? And Yes, and so yes, yes. Absolutely. So I think, okay, so technology is a tool that's helping us to do what we want to do as human beings. And again, I'm going to go back to what I said at the beginning, which is all about, we want to be creative, collaborative. We want to interact. We want to have new experiences. So what the technology enables is the democratization of experiences. So now, for example, when you're talking about um, being able to present yourself as an avatar if you want to, or work in a virtual space in VR, or interact with perhaps your learning or a certain part of your work through augmented reality, all pieces of this metaverse, right? Which has existed for a long time. Now the phrasing and the terminology is becoming all popular, but we've had AI, um, you know, blockchain has been in talks for a while. What, what it is is that people now are like, okay, I've worked and lived and socialized a certain way before the pandemic, now that the pandemic happened, we learned from like Zoom that we, wait a minute, I can actually work remotely. Might not like it all the time, but I could work remotely and engage in meetings and still learn and still produce and still be productive on a video, right? Just as simple as that. And that was already people being in the metaverse, if you would say, right? But now we can add layers of experience to it. And if you so choose to, you can now work in a virtual environment, you can learn through creating, you know, AI helping you to learn along the way and curate that experience for you with personalized recommendations and coaches and bots and all the things, right? So I think all we're seeing is a new layer of experience that's added onto what we've been doing all along. We're just reimagining work, the work, the worker and workplace. And that's what that's what we're seeing. Now, as far as I think there's an opportunity that this new uh, technology, and you mentioned the metaverse and, and even just working in hybrid and is creating that people are flattening out the playing field. So now companies who used to be die hard, you have to work here in our office, you have to be here located right next to our vicinity. Now they've opened it up and they're getting talent from across the pond, across the globe, uh, you know, from wherever. Uh, and so it's creating new opportunities for people. And all of the technology that's being created and that we're heading into is opening the playing fields for people who were creatives, designers, um, gamers, um, all kinds of things like that. Probably you were in media, you were in graphic design. Now you're able to work for a corporation that, you know, for example, I, I know some of, you know, retailers and et cetera are starting to enter into these more virtual worlds and how they deal with consumers and how they do uh, transactions. And maybe they're doing transactions with uh, cryptocurrencies and on the blockchain to credentials, you know? So there's so many more opportunities that are opening up for people to um, get into new roles. So it's exciting. That is exciting. I wanted to go back to, you know, you mentioned this, this idea of, uh, of technology and AI in specific helping to sort of level the playing yeah. field in terms of access to, to the jobs and the employment opportunities. And, and I, I came up a couple of times, I think, in, in researching, you know, the, the wonderful work that you're doing, that that phrase was there. And I, I just wanted to know what you might say to anyone who, who might misinterpret that phrasing or that claim as a form of sort of technological determinism in, in a sense that it, it uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure that like me, you must have some, uh, some cautions and some concerns about over-reliance on technology 
as solutions where, you know, really humans should be solving problems yeah. and using uh, technology to, to deploy and amplify the solutions that we, we find. Um, I, I wonder though, you know, and how does that, the concept of leveling the playing field with technology play into the, the, um, the diversity and inclusion aspect of the work that you're doing? How do we make sure that we're really creating, you know, the truly level playing field and that we're not mm -hmm. uh, amplifying the biases and the, the existing opportunities that, that were already inequitable to begin with? Yeah. I think that more organizations, uh, because of legislation that's being passed even now, you've probably seen this over the past couple of weeks alone and over the past few months, we're seeing uh, legislative bodies, organizations are saying, hey, when it comes to how you use AI, you need to be ethical. You need to have some governance attached to that. You need to have responsibility, explainability, or you know, you, you have to kind of uh, be accountable to, to what it is that you're doing and how you're using people's data what data is going into how you're training your algorithms because people have already found and myself included have been speaking up on these issues that there's a lot of bias and discrimination that happens when you're using systems to come to make decisions on people. And so we, what, what I would say that we need is more of a concept of like AI DevOps where we're thinking about uh, all of the factors that I just mentioned, where we're taking accountability and responsibility and explaining to people, this is how we use your data. Do we have permission to use your data in this way? This is how we're using your data. By the way, there's more organizations coming up now that are allowing, especially minority users, to monetize on how their data is being used, which goes back to a previous conversation or the previous question you were asking. Even this concept of the metaverse, we're going to see that more where people are now using non-fungible tokens, NFTs, they're using all these uh, type of um, the blockchain, they're credentializing and they're putting a stamp on, I own this, this is who I am, this is what I own. Maybe I wanna form an organization virtually and a DAO that people call it, call it. But all of that is, is that people want more agency over their data, their information and how it's being used. So that is what we're seeing now. And I think in order to like continue moving forward with AI that's truly responsible, it's great for these like governing bodies to be doing, putting on the pressure and, you know, governing bodies put the pressure on organizations, even at the uh, um, investment level uh, that they had to diversify, right? They had to in increase diversity, equity, and inclusion in their organizations. So now we saw these pledges and all these promises and organizations doing doing great things and hopefully they're sticking to it. Uh, but diverse minds are needed at the table. And I'm gonna say that. So we need designers, policymakers, data scientists that don't only look the same and are not the traditional people who've always been building the same stuff. We need to address the data itself. So you know, an algorithm that's trained on mostly data that comes from one representation over the other, it's gonna cause a problem. So it's gonna cause a problem from when you're allowing that algorithm to determine candidate relevancy, if you're gonna hire someone, um, if you're gonna determine somebody's credit uh, ability or, you know, image classification, uh, standards that we apply on people, like you have to mix up that data with, with a mix of representation. And people at the table who are making uh, this AI and governing it and overseeing it, they need to be at the table too, right? So I think we need, we need that more. Absolutely. <laughs> you brought up the metaverse again, and, and that actually in, in the context of what you're talking about, it made me uh, wanna merge those two topics, you know, thinking about equity and inclusion and thinking about you know, how we navigate privilege, uh, socioeconomic privilege, for example. Yeah. When you think about the metaverse, what issues around diversity and inclusion and navigating socioeconomic privilege come up for you? And how do you think that we can begin to build guardrails and insurances that, that, allow, that, that provide for the most inclusive experiences in the metaverse? Yeah, at, at its basic level, one of the things that I think of is access. So I talked about democratization earlier. If only a few people have access, because for example, even with uh, NFTs, if you start looking at the demographics of people who own NFTs or even those collections that do the best, they tend to be those who are not people of color. Um, there's not a lot of representation of people of color and women 
in these spaces, whether you own these digital assets or whether you you see yourself reflected in the artwork and the music and the assets themselves. So right there, what we're seeing is just another virtual area, virtual uh, manifestation of a human problem that we've had in our society for a long time. So there's already issues at the systemic level that they show, they're gonna continue showing up no matter where we present it. Um, so I think that needs to be done and a way to fix that would be, uh, we're seeing people you know, have collectives where they're, they're um, inviting and encouraging and amplifying women and people of color to be the artists and the designers and the voices of certain NFT collections. So if you're a celebrity out there, you have a lot of money and you're creating something uh, or you're an organization out there and you're investing a lot of money in whatever you know NFT or coin tokens or whatever you're trying to work on, maybe start amplifying groups and designers and people who are of an underrepresented uh, demographic. Another one is a lot of the platforms uh, and the technology that's used to enter into these spaces, they're expensive. Not everybody has access to be able to, you know, get a VR goggle set and be able to get into virtual reality that way. So I think designers, producers, um, you know, people going to market, they need to create easy entry points and democratize that experience so that all people of all kind of backgrounds can start to get into this space and not just create this bubble of, oh, it's this select private group of people of a or certain socioeconomic status that are entering into this place and still leaving others behind. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Access and, and those issues are, are huge and, and foundational to all this. I, I also feel like what you just talked about gave me uh, one more provocation, which is I want to I want to blend together and, and uh, intersect the, the topics of the metaverse and diversity and inclusion and the future of work. And I wondered, yep. you know, how do you see that playing out in terms of the uh, are there opportunities within the metaverse or social worlds that 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 sort of uh, foster work environments, or that we can bring over to work environments, or bring work environments over to, that that um, that somehow provide opportunities for uh, for more diverse and inclusive teams. Do you see that sort of of opportunity there? Yeah, I do, and I, I think one of the areas is even in accessibility and representation of people with disabilities. For example, right now, you know, the the world of work is waking up to something that I've been championing for a long time now. As a neurodivergent person myself, who has dyslexia, um, I know that there are people on the spectrum. Whether you have autism, Asperger's, ADHD, dyslexia, whatever it is, are brilliant minds. Are brilliant minds, right? I have to, you know, lie to myself. But I'm saying, you know, I think that it's, it's important to make sure that that talent and that skill set is represented in the work, too, but that they can also work on these projects themselves. We need back to what I said earlier about the people, the right people at the table, not only people of uh, color and different genders, but we also need people with disabilities and all kinds of different backgrounds. So. I think, for example, one of the projects that I'm, I'm working on and, and talking to some designers and et cetera about is your avatar should also represent you. If you choose that, if you have a disability and it's a visible one and you choose to not represent that as your digital identity, then you don't have to. But maybe there's some people that want to identify themselves and they want to be seen as they represent themselves in the physical. So right now, today, there's so many like avatars that exist and people are creating all this. But it's kind of like hiding behind, uh, you know, an image. And there's not a lot of opportunity to create what you truly look like. And whether that's you got big curly hair like me, whether your skin tone shows up a certain way, uh, whether you uh, have a cane or you're in a wheelchair or you have a breathing tube or whatever that might look like. Um, I think there's another opportunity there. The future of work is should be a space where people are encouraged to bring their true full selves to the table and that they're heard and that who they are is represented in what they're working on and, and what they do. I think we've had way too much of a focus on customer experience because we're trying to drive profitability and revenue. So we wanna be representative there. We wanna make sure our products are showing that and et cetera. But internally, behind the scenes, you know, that's another story that we really need to, to work on. 
Yeah, you, yeah you're, you're hitting on so many wonderful points. Thank you for, for spending the time with us. I also, um, you said something earlier about uh, neurodivergence and about learning, and I, I knew that I wanted to make sure to include our dis- in that, that in our discussion. You, uh, I know you've talked a lot on stages and in interviews about uh, the adaptive power of, of learning, you know, ha- how anybody can any- learn anything. I also want to tell you that there was something I was watching one of your talks and um, you mentioned this story about uh, it was the story about the reverse word order of the Starbucks order that you were trying to place. And in that discussion, you mentioned that because your family was speaking Spanish at home, how that threw you as well because of the reverse word order. And that blew my mind because I've actually never heard anyone make that observation as a language nerd, as someone who's multilingual. Um, that that observation was a new one to me. And I think that's a, a profound experiential insight and mm-hmm. one that I, I wanted to thank you for sharing. Oh, thanks. Thanks for listening. You know, on that point, I was going to say that, you know, I talk a lot about artificial intelligence and the thing about AI and even how it's going to show up in, in, in the worlds that we live in right now. I'll give a quick example. There, there's an AI that was created recently by a group that she is an Afro-Latina. And how can you have an AI that's an Afro-Latina? Well, when you talk to Alexa, Siri, et cetera, you, you're using a voice you know, command and it's going to a system. It's, it's taking what you're saying in natural language processing, going to a system in real time, quickly like synthesizing that and giving you an answer back. But the data that it's trained on is you know sometimes it doesn't have cultural context and sometimes it doesn't know you know probably couldn't go between different languages and pick up on what you're saying so in my world i speak spanglish right so it's like i go between english y espanol right back and forth i'm like a living encanto you know like that disney that disney movie (laughs) so my family's like that and what if you know this ai bot is able to interact with people in from an afro latina co- cultural context that it understands the spanglish that it has been trained on english and spanish and it understands the cultural context of phrases and idioms and um you know expressions etc and then it's able to uh help a user you know and and, and interact with someone of that so I think we're going to see more of that too, to your, to the point of language and culture, that we'll be able to interact more with avatars or chatbots or uh, you know different identities that understand the nuances of different cultures if we train the data that way. So I definitely wanted to put that out there because that could be used across a gamut of different experiences, you know, non-binary, um, veterans, and how they think, etc. Yeah, no, that's a really important point. I think that that does often get overlooked, not only as you mentioned, uh, the the importance of representation in data sets to make sure we have diverse and inclusive data sets, but also the the importance of of modeling uh, diverse cultures in in conversational AI and and having you know these kinds of um, uh, metaverse avatars potentially that that are also diverse and inclusive that's a wonderful range of of considerations to, to yeah. keep in mind but i know you also talk about how ai can can help with um with learning help people learn anything and i just want to focus on that in particular as it relates to the future of work and the future of jobs um because i feel like such an important topic in the future of jobs in particular is about upskilling and reskilling and so, you know, I think a lot of times people's concerns when they think about, you know, the displacement and replacement of certain types of job functions and jobs overall is in how do we make sure that people who are being displaced um, from these kinds of jobs have the opportunity to learn new functions. And so how do you yeah. anticipate, you know, AI and other emerging technologies having a role in that, in facilitating that kind of learning? So learning experience platforms have been using artificial intelligence now for years to help personalize the learning experience. So you can use AI even today to help understand where a user might be going through a course and not understanding something because maybe it's you're literally going back into that video several times and having to hit replay and maybe your attention was off or maybe you just really didn't get the concept the first time. So now artificial intelligence and machine learning can understand where you might be getting stuck and pause you there and curate uh, recommended uh, 
tool or give you more resources that you might need based on the behavior that you're using inside of inside of your learning experience. Um, that's that's one way. The other way is like we use Netflix, right? So when you're watching Netflix, what happens you, or whatever you're watching out there, it's it's going to keep you in that um, loop of watching a bunch of content and binge watching because it understands what you're liking, your preferences. It's learning from your data and your history. And the same thing with learning. So if I'm learning and I'm, and I'm looking at, at a lot about the, the metaverse or I'm trying to look at a lot of courses on AI and, and that, it's going to feed me different curated content to help me uh, continue my learning. Um, I've also seen learning in the flow of work is another concept here. So think of like if you were using a platform and you were on a software, it was your first time using it, and you're now being able to have a chat bot that guides you. Okay, step one, go here to run this report. Step two, click on here. Step three, and it's helping you learn as you work. Um, we're seeing that also on the floors of certain manufacturing plants um, and uh, yeah, certain organizations with people with disabilities are even taking advantage of that to help uh, give them an entryway to learn at work and help them in the flow of their work. So it could be like, all right, step one with their iPad is uh, scan here. And then there could be a robot or an actual iPad or app. And it's going to tell them, okay, next you need to put this in the bin. Secondly, take this across to aisle two. And it's doing these kind of things to help people. And I think learning in that way, um, whether it's personalization through your your actual learning experience and a, by powered by AI, or maybe it's a bot that's helping you along the way, or a robot or whatever it is, it's it's learning from how we the data inputs that we're giving it, and it's learning from our behavior and then guiding us. And I think that's how people can learn um, as yeah with AI. Do you foresee there being a uh, sort of curriculum design around, um, it, it sounds like what you're describing is sort of this adaptive learning process where, whereby I might go in with no concept of what job I might qualify for or be best suited to, but once I start a sort of generalized education plan that there may be um, to your Netflix, you know, sort of curated recommendation example that, because I did really well over here, maybe I wanna try more of this kind of jobs learning or this kind of uh, skill that, that I can be educated on. Is, is that kind of thing already taking place in reskilling and upskilling programs or, do, or is it something that you see that there's um, more investment coming that, that it isn't quite fully realized yet? Yes and yes. So okay. I, I see a lot of companies are starting to like break down jobs and job descriptions and understand what are the skills that are needed for that role. When they're able to do that, they're now able to start applying analytics and forecast and plan, okay, if this is a role for the future, maybe it doesn't exist today, and maybe this person doesn't yet have all the qualifications for this other role, but they express to us an interest in this area, they express to us certain qualifications that they do have today, and now AI can help and data would help to match and help a human you know, talent acquisition person or a career developer or a manager to help guide that user to say, this is where you are today. This is where you wanna be. So let's help map out a career plan for you to get to where you should be. And I'll give you a quick example. A few months ago, I saw that there was an organization that was opening up uh, job roles for caregivers and retirees to re-enter the workforce. And they said, we are willing to, hi to hire you at what the experience that you are at today. So we'll meet you where you are and we will help you fulfill the gaps uh, to where you should be. And I was just on a call the other day with another organization who was talking about um, wanting to hire more neurodivergent candidates or people with disabilities. And even if they're entry level and they haven't had the experience, they wanna make sure they have the foundation that they need, but they'll, they'll reach them with the rest. And humans are doing that today, but AI has the ability to also understand what, what is the rest that's needed to get someone from point A to point B. So in general, what I'm saying is I think AI could be used uh, to do what you're saying um, because it's meeting people where they are. And in that way, people can learn anywhere and anything. Yeah, I wonder too also what, what you're thinking about the types of jobs that you anticipate uh, for the future. I, I think so much has been um, 
so much has been made about the kinds of jobs we know are going away, and those are important to consider. Right. We we know, for example, that cashier work and truck drivers, and these these are some very discrete roles that, um, because of the unique capabilities of machines that are already uh, being developed, we we know that those types of roles are are going to be limited uh, right. for human for human jobs. But then that leaves all these people who were in these types of jobs or who would yes. have gone into that pipeline. Um, what do you see as emerging at that at one level for the for the people who are coming in uh, needing new skills and and at the the sort of entry level of of the skills? Also, what do you see happening for people who are a little more on the the highly skilled side who are moving into roles that are you know out of roles that are being displaced by automation? And how do, how do you see that pipeline working? Is it different? Is it the same? You know, how, how, is, how is this all going to take shape? What are, the, what are those yes. job roles look like? Is that enough questions loaded into one for you? I don't know. Maybe one more <laughs> question for what is there. <laughs> I bet I can do it. I bet I can do it. I would say that I think one of the key areas is uh, as we continue exploring the where, the, the what the work is, so the workplace, the worker, and the work that's being done, as we keep applying creativity to it and digital transformation keeps occurring, we keep forming new roles. So if you look today, um, oh, we keep forming new roles, but we also see uh, a resurgence and a reemergence of certain roles taking more importance than, than even before. For example, um, leadership development is on the rise now more than ever. Why? Because if you look at the past few years and the way that people have been leaving their workplaces and going to others and jumping ship and that's that there's a need for leaders to lead well and so we're seeing now at a very human aspect of technology aside that we're seeing people who need to uh work in that area and to develop leaders to give them skills to do all of that and that's not that's nothing new that's that's been you know ages and ages of, of a role but it's it's there's more of it now diversity equity inclusion officers uh, of diversity have been created in um, organizations that never had it before because, because again, legislation and the way the world was going, uh, people had to start opening up roles like that when they didn't even have a department before. So now we're seeing that. As we move into more virtual experiences, we need creators. So again, uh, I know I have some friends even who work as 3D graphic designers who before in their career, when they got out of school, they were working on like, Pixar type of movies and uh, you know working on gaming, but now we're seeing organizations like uh, big technology organizations, people who enable virtual uh, and video interactions are creating layers of experience that need those same designers and that same talent, gamers and all types of creators to now come into their spaces to become, uh, to start helping them shape the future of what their next technology offerings are gonna look like. So before, if you used to be into videography or graphic design or gaming or whatever, now there's space for you at these organizations that probably specialize in human capital management, um, social management, social media management, um, you name it, like all these organizations. Uh, to give you a quick uh, example, Subway. Subway opened up a virtual space in the metaverse. So they created a, a virtual land and they allowed uh, for an employee to man a virtual store. So you could go virtually into a subway, order, a, order a, a subway sandwich down the line, like if you're there in person and there's somebody who's actually manning that. There's That's a job. We're seeing metaverse, chief metaverse officers come up uh, as a new thing. Um, and apart from all of that side of the world uh, of, of that you know virtual space, we need people to manage, um, we need legal, Council. We need people who work on AI and ethics and governance of data, data scientists on the rise and roles that are about data analytics. So all of that is coming up, right? We, we need more people to talk about these things and represent it as content um, creators, writers, editors, you know, so while some roles, you know, fade out, new roles become created. Also with the fading out of certain roles, then you have new uh, new ones that are created. For example, when Postmates came out and they were delivering, um, you know, to people's homes or or wherever it was, a college campuses, etc., with a robot, the person who was making sure that that robot didn't get hijacked, jumped, vandalized, or whatever the case is, 
it was a human person, a gamer for the most part. It was a, like a young kid working from their apartment somewhere or on a campus who could virtually navigate that robot so that if it flipped over on its side or whatever, it would take manual control over it, set it right back up on its side and find it and, and do whatever it needed to do. So that's the actual role that was created. So there's, again, Yes, certain jobs get faded out, but there's new ones that are created and there's so much opportunity for past roles to, to reemerge as well. Yeah, I love that. And the, uh, the Postmates or, or um, robot delivery person supervisor is an interesting, interesting emergent role. Yeah. <laughs> it does seem like if, you're, if your job is, uh, is largely about preventing the theft of a robot or the turtling of a robot it kind of feels like a very interesting job. Um, yeah. You talked about, um, about we've talked a, a few times in a few ways about diversity and inclusion in the workplace, and, and you talked about diversity officers, but I wonder about, you know, more integrative ways to prevent uh, bias or to mitigate bias and improve inclusivity in workplaces. How do you think about that sort of systemically? How do you think about it in an integrative sense? What can we do? First, I think it goes back to the basics of having a regular conversation and creating a space where it's safe to do that. If people are not, and I, and I read a study recently that was talking about, even though a lot of diverse people have been hired and promoted into leadership roles, there's studies that show that they're leaving anyway. They leave, they don't stick around in organization. Why is that? Because no matter what the pay was, no matter what the opportunity was, they're starting, some of them are realizing this was just an effort to maybe fill and check off a box, but the culture doesn't exist here where I truly belong, where I'm truly heard, where I, where I wanna bring something to the forefront and something's really being done about it. So I think to create the culture is the first part. And again, it has nothing to do with technology, it has nothing to do with innovation. We have to go back to very human uh, basic elements, like create that culture first, let people see that they have a voice, uh, that what they say matters, it helps influence the direction of the company. Uh, and then from there, you can do all these neat things. Neat things indeed. <laughs> I think, um, yeah, I think it, it sounds like it's it's so intertwines with so many of the other things you brought up. I mean, when when we're thinking about, you know, new products, emerging products and, and um, you know, launching new initiatives and and there is not a an inclusive data model or there's not uh, an inclusive team at the table who are helping to ensure that, you know, there's representative avatars in the metaverse rollout or whatever, it feels like those are really important pieces of, of yeah. the, the consideration. So um, that that I would um, I would sort of uh, amend, not amend, but add to what you're saying, that it feels like you, you already did kind of cover those things and it feels like that's a really important piece of, of the yeah. discussion. Yeah, and you know, sometimes, Kate, we don't even know how to, approach certain topics, right? We don't know how to have certain conversations, so we avoid them as humans. But technology could even be used to help us along the way. So for example, just a quick use case, and I don't know if this exists, but if it doesn't, people, you're welcome. I'm giving you a, an innovative idea so you can work on it. Take like, notes. <laughs> take notes, people. What if, you know, what if you were on a call and you showed up and you didn't know how to address someone because their pronouns weren't there? right? Or whatever the case is, right? So maybe that you don't know how to, how to act or how to react in a certain way. Maybe technology could be used and embedded there to give you, uh, to make a pop-up on the screen and um, ask or look into the data of that individual if they so wanted to and help the other user to understand what it is. How do you address that person? How do you pronounce their name appropriately? Um, how do you... Uh, understand someone, perhaps it could be machine learning and AI direct on the moment, translating what somebody is signing in, in American Sign Language uh, or in whatever type of sign language that they're using, and you can understand what they're saying in real time because AI helped you do that. So there's many, many different approaches and ways in which technology can help us be even better um, with how we show up with each other. 
I love that. And it feels like that's that to me is, is about the uh, the augmented reality potential uh, as much as it is any other metaverse or, or AI consideration, yeah. because it feels like this, there's so much that's already out there. Like if I'm meeting with you for the first time and I want to, you know, do some research and make sure I'm acquainted with who you are and your body of work. I mean, a lot of what you just described is probably going to be out there readily available. And so, yeah, yes. so the ability to sort of scoop that up and, and make it um, whatever is publicly available that you've chosen to share, yes. uh, but to make that readily digestible feels like it is a boon to, yeah. to uh, connection. Mm -hmm. I also think about this this role of, um, you know, in, in terms of the, the emerging roles in the workplace and the kinds of jobs that people might have. One of the experiences that, that I have uh, working with AI in a, in, a, um, in a role or in a facet of my day-to-day -day work is I'm using a writing tool called Jasper. It's actually just been recently renamed to Jasper. It was Jarvis, but apparently okay. the Marvel Universe, uh, the Disney lawyers came after uh -oh. Jarvis.ai. So they're renamed to Jasper. And one of the things that, that occurs to me is it's, it's a very good tool for breaking through writer's block. Because, you know, if you just say, I'm going to be talking to Giselle and we want to talk about the future of work and the future of jobs. Okay, that's it. That's all I could think of. And then you encourage the AI to, you know, sort of write. It's going to come up with stuff that's not very useful a good right. deal of the time. But every once in a while, it's going to come up with a prompt that you go like, oh, I would never have thought of that. Yeah. And to me, that feels like one of the skills that we're going to be seeing in uh, in the next few years, really, this hybrid of um, utilizing AI tools and bringing human sensibility, yes. human creativity. Do you see that in, in a lot of capacities? How, how do you envision that coming to play? I think you're, you're on it. I think that it's, uh, there's so much data, a body of data out there that you can now create new things, new possibilities. Even today, if you look it up, you can find that there are um, synthetic voices and uh, that are AI enabled. There are synthetic, there's music that's being created, art that's being created. Um, people can write poetry. There's new things that exist out there, um, even images. So there are characters that show up as avatars that they're not really any any one particular person. In fact, the, the AI that I told you about, that's an Afro-Latina, the way that they used uh, to generate the image of that avatar was by using GANS, um, G-A-N-S, which is an AI approach that learns from multiple different images, puts them together and creates something new uh, in that case. And so it created, it looked and sorted through lots of different types of faces of Afro-Latinas and it was able to come up with a new image that, of someone that doesn't exist. Um, so yes, there's an opportunity for us to see and explore and learn. Um, I spoke about this at a conference, at a tech conference some years ago about like the next of AI. And that's one of the things that I said that it's gonna help us, it's gonna help recommend what we don't know yet. Um, because of looking at data and being able to come up with new opportunities. So for example, a, a quick use case could be, what about a role that doesn't exist yet? And so what if you wanted to plan out and say, hmm, what new role could my organization use based on the direction of where the market is going, um, the qualifications, um, how, we, how we make revenue, how we make money? Like you can put a lot of factors together and say, well, an area of need could be and structure a new job description, a new title, something that doesn't exist yet. And maybe it'll be a little wonky at the beginning, like you just said, but maybe there's some some goal to that and some some something to think about. So yeah, there's a lot of ways in which AI can help us to sort through masses of data um, on how we behave, on what matters to us, on what matters to other people, and then come up with new possibilities. Those new possibilities sound pretty exciting. And I think, you know, you and I both are alike in, in you know, being excited and, and um, hopeful for those possibilities. I also wonder, though, when you talk to um, people who are in leadership positions, who are making decisions using technology, who are, in, uh, you know, sort of putting in place some of these AI uh, solutions, what kind of guardrails do you want to make sure that they're putting in place, what kinds of advice would you want to give any listener out there who is a leader, who is considering using technology in these ways? Um, what do you want them to keep in mind as they run yeah, out? 
For sure. Uh, goes back to accountability. Uh, so I would say if you're the one who's creating it or if you're buying a tool that's using AI, uh, make sure that you vet how is this working and how is it coming up with a recommendation or a decision you know, on whoever, on our employees, on our clients, on who are our consumers, whatever it is. And so think about one, who's creating this, who's working on this. If you buy a tool that's saying we're AI enabled and we use AI for this or that, please ask questions. How do you uh, protect people's data? You know, how is your algorithm making sure that it's not discriminating against certain groups of people? Ask, hold people accountable. And if you're the one creating it and you have teams creating it, then create systems. You should have an AI ethics board in your organization. If you are developing any AI tool, you should have governance. Invite outside consultants to look at what you're doing and to vet and expect it, just like you would inspect your tax compliance and all kinds of things like that. Don't wait until a legislative body comes up with something for you to then take action. What that kind of looks like is that you're just trying to make sure that you check off boxes if that's what you're doing. But try to be ahead of it. Try to um, think in advance. Invite people in your organization that don't work in AI per se, but you would want their perspective. Invite your ERGs to weigh in on how you're developing a product. Does this sound right? Does this look right? Um, sh should we be looking at these types of data? How do you feel about this? So I think it's a, it's a more, again, it requires a more ethical, open governance approach. And that, that's what I would say. Um, I would love to see more organizations have like reports, report cards, if you will, or accountability reports where it shows this is how we use the AI. This is uh, how we reported on the data. This is, you know, exciting. Like break it down for the people if you're using it, um, because I think that level of accountability is what people are looking for now than than ever before. Yeah, that's that's. I love that, and I also I wanted to go back and think about the two things that we talked about. We talked about the opportunity to use AI. Um, to reskill and and upskill people who were being displaced um, from other types of automation, and we talked about the potential of organizations to use AI to potentially surface job roles um, mm -hmm. or you know new ways to to organize their 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 company. Um, these feel like they're inherently kind of related. Um, do you know of any organizations that are taking that approach? Do you do you anticipate? that that's something that that will become like somebody's going to steal that right out of this discussion i mean <laughs> they might as well right they might as you well see, you see that in place anywhere <laughs> hey me and uh kate and we'll we'll come and help you out with that <laughs> so i would say yes there are some organizations that are doing this in, in certain capacities and i feel like there's going to be a more um collaborative situation that's happening so some people are working on job taxonomies and skills taxonomies where they're breaking down and understanding what makes a role. And then there's some people that are looking at where are the skills? Um, where can we tap into? Because we often hear, oh, there's not enough, you know, there's not enough people of color who are in finance or in tech. So we, we don't have the, the, the candidate pool in this particular area, but we're seeing that that's not often the case. We're just not knowing where to fish. You gotta fish in other ponds and be more creative. And so uh, technology is being able to show people uh, what are the skills, what are the jobs, what's coming, how do you uh, take somebody from where they are today and, and what do they need as far as skills development to get them to where you want them to be. All of that is, is happening and, and I have seen different organizations uh, create aspects of all of what I just mentioned. I'm not sure that I've seen one do it all yet, um, but there are some really cool companies that, that I know of, um, even where I'm working at right now with ADP, they, they have, um, some, some opportunities through, uh, how we're looking at job tax and skills taxonomies and how we're breaking it down and then showing talent acquisitions, people, talent market insights so that they could see by demographic, by, uh, by area, where are the skills? Um, and yeah, there's, there's a lot of great things happening uh, across organizations. Yeah, that feels like an enormous opportunity. So I really hope that there are folks listening who would go, you know, gee, maybe we should get on this and, and really make this a much more yeah. dimensional offering and something that brings a lot of value to, to people and to employers as well. 
Um, I am really excited. This, this so far has been a fantastic conversation. I just want to also offer a moment for you in case there's anything I haven't asked you that you really wanted to make sure that we discussed. Uh, what, what, what might that be? Anything? I guess I'll just like reemphasize the point of um, we really need to think about being more inclusive of all, right? I, I read a recent article that was talking about gender equity. Um, so we talk a lot about pay equity, but sometimes we forgot about gender equity. And we forget that, for example, what if you don't identify as a man or a woman, for example, and what about your pay equity, right? Isn't it, we don't often talk about that. We talk about like men versus women's pay. And we talk about like minorities and race and ethnicity, but we forget about like other groups of people who, what about their pay and their representation? What about their leadership opportunities and, and things like that and promotion? So there's that. And then there's like men who also are, are at home and they're caregiving and they're, or they're taking care of the children. And like, we forget about them. So it's like, there's, there's so much that we often overlook because we, we hyper-focus on what we think inclusion means. And we forget that it's about all. Um, and I think I just like to emphasize that point a little bit, because again, I'm all about an inclusive future of work. And that means taking everybody with us, everyone, um, no matter what that person's background and situation is, so. And I feel like what you're driving at too, is that there's, there's a much more holistic and systemic way to think about those kinds of relationships, right? That, yes. that making sure that um, fathers or, or men who are at home caregiving for families um, are able to be cared for means that there can be more gender equity or parity in the workplace too. Um, yes. in, in the case of, um, well, any kind of relationship that they may be in. But mm -hmm. but that that kind of discussion, I think, does often get overlooked because it gets so oversimplified. And I think your your call to to bring the nuance to that discussion and make sure that we're having a, a an integrative, nuanced, dimensional, you know, intersectional kind of discussion there is a really important one. So thank you. Yeah. For that. And, the, and the last thing I'll share is just I guess that I would like to share is where we're seeing the direction of the world of work going right now, like it's it's basically that people want to have more agency over how they work, where they work, and and you know themselves, et cetera. And so we're seeing this concept of things being decentralized. And I think there's something to that. I think people want to own how they show up in the world, and that's where we're seeing like blockchain and um, credentialing, and we're seeing people want to own more of their like financial. Um, abilities. They want to keep more of their pay. So we're seeing more around like cryptocurrencies that come up and all kinds of different things. And, and I think if you just wade through all of the buzzwords that are coming out lately and, and all the, uh, that we're seeing at its core, people want to imagine a different world of work. That's all that it is. We want to be able to um, be themselves, represent themselves how they want to be represented with their identity, if it's a digital identity or not. They want to be able to choose when, where, how, what they work on. Like, think about breaking down a job. And uh, I was talking to someone the other day who was saying, you know, we have trouble finding, uh, you know, diverse leadership in our organization and bringing them up. And I was talking to them and saying how I've seen articles and different things come out. And I've been talking about this for some time too. Break down a job. Let people be able to work on projects to, to be able to, to build up their skill set. And uh, maybe they don't have what it takes today fully on paper to be that what you might be looking for. But maybe you can give them exposure to that and help them from the inside of your organization to take on those roles um, as well. So like that's another area where I think if we start looking at work differently, uh, it, it'll help us to get to where we're trying to go to. And I think it's, it's a very non-traditional approach, but it's here and it's, that's what we're seeing right now. I love that. I think it's so important for us to, to be reconsidering what it means to have a job, to contribute, to have a sense of accomplishment and be part of it, feel part of a team. It doesn't necessarily have to mean that kind of traditional employment. And yeah. I love the idea of breaking those jobs down, especially jobs that you know, you're having a hard time sourcing for, and especially if you really are trying to, you know, have an eye toward diversity and inclusion with your staffing, which, you know, we all should be, um, it, it can be hard to, to find that right talent. But of course, break it down. That's a, that's yeah. a brilliant observation. Um, I think we're at time. I wanted to honor that. Uh, so thank you very, very much. 